Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and as Thomas moved into the heart of Reconstruction, he became torn on who to follow orders from and become disheartened at his lack of authority to intervene on behalf of Unionists and freedmen in his department. For those who might not know, I have a George Thomas shirt available on the Teespring store. Please check it out and consider buying one to support the channel. When 1866 began, George Thomas had about 25,000 soldiers under his command. By May, that number dropped to 4,000 as his troops began to muster out of service. On May 1st, a riot broke out in Memphis when black federal troops prevented a black civilian from being arrested by local authorities. By the next day, a white mob had formed and attacked the African-American community of the city, burning down that part of the city and killing over 40 freedmen. Thomas found out about this riot on May 3rd from the newspapers. His commander of that district, George Stoneman, had not intervened or even notified Thomas of the problems in Memphis. Thomas immediately ordered Stoneman to intervene and put a stop to the violence. The riot was put down, but the damage had been done. On July 3rd, Ulysses S. Grant issued General Orders No. 44, which allowed commanders to arrest violators of black civil rights when local authorities would not act. On August 15th, Thomas had found the instigators of the white mob that started the riot in Memphis, and because of this order, thought he could prosecute them in a military court. He sent off his request to do so, but President Johnson said to let the civil authorities handle it, even though they would not indict the rioters. This angered Thomas, but there was nothing he could do. Violence persisted throughout the South, and guerrilla bands and bandits still plagued the countryside, committing horrendous acts against African Americans and white Unionists. Thomas did all he could to stop such attacks, but his limited number of troops hampered most of his initiatives. In November 1866, a public ceremony was held in Louisville, Kentucky to honor Confederate General Roger Hansen. Thomas wrote that these ceremonies, which he suspected would take the character of a military parade, would be insulting to loyal citizens and would tend to be a breach of the peace. Also, many of the participants in the ceremonies would be former Confederate soldiers, and Thomas considered their participation in a public demonstration that had a military character to be a violation of their paroles. Thomas issued an order prohibiting any military display during the funeral ceremony, particularly any display of the Confederate flag. In January 1867, the citizens of Rome, Georgia also held a ceremony for General Hansen, but they displayed a Confederate flag. Thomas had the men responsible for displaying the flag put under arrest. He also made a formal statement published in a newspaper. He said, In your letter you state that no disrespect was intended to the United States government by the exhibition of the Confederate flag. If that is the case, it can now only be supposed, presuming that they possess ordinary intelligence, that they misunderstand the present status of affairs, which is that the rebellion has been decided to be a huge crime embodying all the crimes of the Decalogue, and that it has been conquered and disarmed, and that its very name emblems are hateful to the people of the United States, and he must be indeed obtuse who expects without offense to parade before the eyes of loyal people that which they execrate, and that their abhorrence of which they have expressed in the most emphatic language in which it is possible for a great nation to utter its sentiments. The sole cause of this and similar offenses lies in the fact that certain citizens of Rome and a portion of the people of the states lately in the rebellion do not and have not accepted the situation, and that is that the late Civil War was a rebellion and history will so record it. Those engaged in it are and will be pronounced rebels. Rebellion implies treason, and treason is a crime, and a heinous one too, and deserving of punishment, and that traitors have not been punished is owing to the magnanimity of the conquerors. With too many of the people of the South, they are trying to throw the gloss of respectability and thrusting with contumely and derision from their society the men and women who would not join hands with them in the work of ruining their country. Thomas arrested many former Confederates for violating their paroles, like William A. Milliken. His court case gained national attention. Thomas had Milliken arrested for threatening a federal officer, who Milliken said was politically organizing black men. The judge ruled that when Johnson declared the rebellion over in 1866, that parole violations was no longer a valid charge. Thomas attempted to appeal it to the Supreme Court, but Johnson turned down that idea. In March 1867, Congress reconstructed the districts of Reconstruction and wanted Thomas to command the 3rd District, encompassing Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. 
He made it known that he did not want the job and suggested John Pope command that district. Pope took command of the 3rd District, and Thomas now commanded the newly restructured Department of the Cumberland, contained in Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia. All of those states were in the Union, so he probably thought he would have less political duties if he stayed in command of them. In the years after the Civil War, Thomas gained a considerable amount of weight, which probably helped lead to his high blood pressure and a cardiovascular disease. His doctor, without the knowledge of Thomas, wrote to Washington informing them that his health would greatly deteriorate if he was moved to the Deep South. The 1867 elections brought more political and racial violence to Thomas's department. Disenfranchised whites who supported the Confederacy became enraged at the thought of African American males getting to vote when they could not. Attacks became more numerous and Thomas had to send troops to Poland locations to keep the order. In Memphis, the city police chief was a Unionist, but the county sheriff had been a secessionist. Violence was set to erupt, so Grant sent Thomas to Memphis personally to oversee that the elections went about without violence. George diplomatically resolved the situation between the two law enforcement officials, and no violence occurred. Of all of the Reconstruction commanders, Thomas stands out as one of the most persistent in pursuing those who attempted to forestall political equality and civil rights of African Americans. The Ku Klux Klan formed in 1866, but began to heavily terrorize the landscape and more specifically the African American community in 1867. Although the state of Tennessee attempted to put down the terrorists with their militia, they needed reinforcements and asked Thomas for help. Thomas more than obliged and used what resources he could to arrest and hunt down Klan members, but his lack of cavalry hindered his ability to hunt down more of them. By 1868, Thomas was disheartened over the lack of obedience by the Southern people. He started out believing that once the war was over, that Southerners would go back to their ordinary ways of life, but it was becoming apparent to him that they were going to fight the social and political change that emerged from the Civil War, even though they had been conquered. The year 1868 was also an election year, and both parties sought to nominate Thomas for president or vice president, although it was the Republicans that put most of the effort in courting him to run for their party. Thomas gave six reasons for turning each party down. First, I am wholly disqualified for so high and responsible a position, being but a mere tiro in the science of statesmanship. Second, I have not the necessary control over my temper, nor have I the faculty of yielding to a policy and working to advance it unless convinced within myself that it is right and honest. Third, my habits of life, established by a training of over 20 years, are such as to make it repugnant to my self-respect to have to induce people to do their duty by persuasive measures. If there is anything that outrages me more than another, it is to see an obstinate and self-willed man oppose what is right morally and under the law simply because under the law he cannot be compelled to do what is right. Fourth, I can never consent voluntarily to place myself in a position where scurrilous newspaper men and political demagogues can make free with my personal character and reputation with impunity. Fifth, I have no taste whatsoever for politics, and besides, restrictions have recently been thrown around the President by Congress, which virtually deprive him of his just powers and rights under the Constitution. I could never consent to be deprived of rights and privileges guaranteed the President by the Constitution, as long as the Constitution remained unaltered. I could cite many more equally valid reasons for not wishing the office. I will name only one more, and not the least. I am poor, and could not afford it. In November 1868, Thomas traveled to Washington to preside over a court of inquiry for Major General Alexander B. Dyer, and while there convened with Grant about further military matters. Grant wanted to send either Thomas or Sheridan to command the Division of the Pacific. Thomas protested at first, but Grant convinced him to take the position, and Henry Halleck would command the Department of the Cumberland. While all that was being worked out, Thomas attended a party given in honor of the Battle of Mill Springs, and then in December, he presided over a grand reunion of the armies of the Cumberland, the Tennessee, the Ohio, and Georgia held in Chicago. Thomas gave some short speeches and was given a standing ovation. In May, the Court of Inquiry concluded and Thomas was able to travel to his new post at San Francisco, and he arrived on June 1, 1869. After two weeks of getting to know his new command, he set off for a tour of the division. He first traveled into Nevada, then to Boise in modern-day Idaho then to Oregon, traveling down the Columbia River to Portland. After inspecting the forts along the coast, he traveled up the coast by boat to Alaska, which had just been purchased two years earlier. Alaska was sparsely settled, 
Many of its residents were Russians who decided to remain in the territory even after the sale to the U.S., and natives who traded first with various companies. Thomas would travel extensively along Alaska's coast and to the Aleutian Islands, where a trading company mined ice for shipment to San Francisco for sale. There were a few military outposts in the territory, so Thomas took a tour of their facilities. Even as an older man, he never lost his love of science and the natural world. He sent some coal samples and walrus bones to the Smithsonian for examination. When he returned to San Francisco, he wrote to the naturalist at the Smithsonian that Alaska would have been an excellent purchase had it been made in 61 and used thereafter as a kind of water and cold air cure for the hot-headed southerners who fell into our hands as prisoners of war. Three months in Alaska are sufficient to cool down the most heated brain. On March 12, 1870, the New York Tribune published a letter that severely criticized Thomas's generalship during the Nashville campaign. Thomas suspected John Schofield of doing this, and he was basically right. The letter was written by one of Schofield's aides from notes prepared by Schofield and with Schofield's approval. Thomas decided to write a rebuttal of the published letter and began working. On the morning of March 28, 1870, Thomas's aide left headquarters at 10.30 a.m. Later that morning, Thomas came out of his office, said, I want air, and collapsed. When the aide returned at 1.45 p.m., he found Thomas laying on a couch with several doctors attending him. As the afternoon wore on, Thomas developed a headache, but he managed to get up briefly and walk around. Francis came to see him, and the couple spoke briefly. Then, according to his aide, Thomas began to struggle with a convulsive movement about his chest and try to rise, which he could not do. Doctors were called, but when they arrived, Thomas had already lost consciousness and would remain unconscious until 7.25 p.m. when he died. When Thomas's body was embalmed, the arteries leading from his heart were found to have fatty deposits. It seems likely that similar arterial blockages caused his fatal stroke. He was only 53 years old. His body would travel to Troy, New York, where he would be buried, but all along the way he would be celebrated at each small and large town. His body would travel to Troy, New York, where he would be buried, but all along the way he would be celebrated at each small and large town. In Chicago, Philip Sheridan and Winfield Scott Hancock presided over a procession that accompanied Thomas's coffin from one train station to the next. Thousands of people lined the streets to watch the procession go by. On April 6th, a memorial service was held at the Capitol attended by President Grant. On April 8th at St. Paul's Episcopal Church, his casket was draped with an American flag and adorned with flowers, and Thomas's sword and a recent photograph were placed on the casket for the public to view. George Meade, William S. Rosecrans, John Schofield, Joseph Hooker, Gordon Granger, John Newton, William B. Hazen, and Andrew J. McKay acted as pallbearers. President Grant led the procession. An estimated 4,000 people and 140 carriages were in the procession. Frances did not attend the services. She left San Francisco a few days after Thomas's body left, so she had a private ceremony after the large one on the 8th. He will be buried in the cemetery of her church. Frances wrote to Sherman after the services to see that Thomas's aides were given jobs in the army. She feared that since Thomas had died, his aides and staff would be forced to resign because of the recent reduction in the army's size. Sherman made sure that his staff all received appointments. Frances would outlive her husband by nearly 20 years. She lived off their savings and her inheritance from her father. In 1879, she applied for the $30 per month pension she was entitled to as George's widow, and in 1885, Congress passed a special bill increasing her pension to $2,000 per year. She would die peacefully after spending a pleasant Christmas evening with her family and friends on December 25, 1889. Although Thomas did not reconcile with his sisters before his death, they did not hold a grudge. They regretted not reconciling with him. As a gesture of reconciliation, his sister Judith sent some acorns from an oak tree on the Thomas family plantation to be planted around his monument in Washington. It seems the acorns were never planted. His sisters donated his sword and some letters to the Virginia Historical Society and recalled affectionately their time as children. George Thomas's name does not command the attention Ulysses S. Grant, Robert E. Lee, William Tecumseh Sherman, or Stonewall Jackson, but his transformation from slave owner to a defender of African American civil rights and his tremendous military actions throughout the Civil War makes him deserving of being remembered as one of the greatest Civil War generals on either side. His stand on Snodgrass Hill 
and his hammering of the Army of Tennessee at Nashville demonstrated his ability to remain cool under fire and his ability to inspire his men to great accomplishments. He will forever be known as the Rock of Chickamauga.